Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, who has been a keen follower of the developments not only of all international issues, but particularly of West Asia, Central Asia and this entire geostrategic part of this region. It's a pleasure to have you with us. It's always a pleasure for me also, an old friend more than anything else, uh, and to be with you. I feel very comfortable talk chatting with you. <laughs> As you know, the Iran-US standoff, particularly with Mr. Trump cancelling the, uh, the nuclear deal, mm -hmm. which not only had the US and Iran, but also other states. It was not just a deal between Iran and the US. What are the ramifications of this in terms of what's likely to happen uh, in, in the West, on investation? You see, uh, it has uh, different templates uh, on the, at the core, very core. Uh, this has been a project which dates back to the Bush administration, Rumsfeld, Cheney, and so on. Uh, the attack on uh, the invasion of Iraq was not accidental. And at that time, the subtext was actually Iran. After finishing that, they would turn to... So, you know, the project is about um, disposing of emergent powers in that region, uh, which would someday be in a position to challenge Israel's supremacy in the region. And Israel is the main instrument for the American hegemony in the region. So stakes are very high. Now the project was completed in Iraq, but uh, then towards the second half of that uh, occupation, it took a very unexpected turn and it didn't happen. Uh, and then the, uh, the, the regime changed in Washington. You had Barack Obama who had a very different uh, attitude towards uh, engaging the Muslim Middle East and you know his famous speech in Cairo University in 2009. Uh, so the Iran part and he had a very different approach to Iran. So as I see it, the project got actually postponed by uh, eight years. And uh, when history is written, my feeling is that this would be uh, coming up as a singular failure on the part of the Obama administration, that the president, that Obama, I don't know what, what, what prevented him, he didn't follow up the nuclear deal of 2015, July. Because uh, if he had provided the underpinnings for the smooth implementation of this, a certain uh, new normal would have come to exist in the US-Israeli, US-Iran relationship and so on. Like for example, uh, what he had to do was to implement the deal from the American side. Now, therefore, what these people have done is they have actually picked up the threads. Now, this has to be clearly understood. And the Iran nuclear deal, rejecting it, is a pretext for it. The real agenda is, to my mind, regime change in Iran. You know, there have been a lot of arguments that even the Obama administration's agreement was essentially to dismantle Iran's centrifuge uh, program and also uh, remove, as you know, the fissile material which had been uh, made up to, I think, 20% uh, uh, rich, uh, richness. I mean, enrichment had to take place only 20%. And that all that material was taken out. That's the con condition of the deal. I think 98% of the fissile material was removed, potentially fissile material and most of its centrifuges from, I think, 18,000, they came down dramatically to much lower figures. So that was the intent, but the Americans were never really going to be very honest in accepting their side of the deal. This was some of the arguments of the deal. And the second part of it, if you think of it, that one of the reasons that they did not go too far on implementation is the kind of attacks they received from the Republican uh, majority at the time in the Senate and, and the Congress that they, that that was could be also a part of the reason 
Obama was not really, didn't want to get too far once he had dismantled Iran's uh, capabilities. You're right. You know, the, uh, I'm not blaming Obama. I'm saying that this will stand out as a failure because uh, this part of it, the epilogue, uh, should have been uh, thought through uh, because this d deal otherwise didn't make sense. This deal should have led to a constructive engagement between the United States and Iran. And that would have been the underpinning. Uh, you see, uh, Iran should have uh, been made a stakeholder. There's no point in talking about, a, uh, like uh, uh, Trump is demanding, that uh, Iran's regional policies are unacceptable. But the point is, why is Iran, Iran has not precipitated a single conflict in that region. Iran has had a role to play, but why is it that Iran has pursued this politics of resistance? Uh, that is because it has been besieged. It's under siege ever since the Islamic Revolution. So a construct, only through a constructive engagement, and I feel, uh, I was reading the other day again this uh, Cairo University speech by Obama. I think left to himself, uh, he apologized for the CIA overthrow of Mossadegh. Now that was an yeah. extraordinary ge gesture, you know. So he, he was, uh, with his sense of history, he was quite aware of uh, what the problem area was. And then he was wanting to win their confidence. And uh, the, the irony is that, you know, that the ruling elite in Iran, their demand is really that they want to be integrated with the Western world. They want technology, capital they, for building themselves up. I have no doubt in my mind that they are uh, not wanting to develop nuclear weapons because uh, knowing their system and their ideology and so on, there is this Fatah by Imam Khomeini and uh, they attach the utmost importance to that kind of thing because it is linked to the legitimacy of the regime. So uh, that's not the issue there. The thing is they want to develop their economy because there's a lot of pressure on that front, you know, the people's expectations. And the, uh, this, is a, this is a regime uh, which is characterized in a certain way by the Western analysts and Western media, but which has a representative character, whether you like it or not. And uh, well, Just to take up the point that you're raising, that they wanted engagement, mm -hmm. and therefore they wanted really the kind of economic sanctions to be lifted. And the reason they had built up the nuclear capability was more a bargaining attempt mm -hmm. in order to bring the United States to the uh, negotiating table mm -hmm. rather than as a route to nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This is, mm -hmm. I think, the point that, you're, uh, that you, you would say is the reason why they developed this nuclear capability. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the nuclear uh, uh, program that they had, uh, you know, uh, it made a quantum jump when Bush just flatly refused to talk to them. That's right. Uh, it, it greatly forward, in fact. You know. Every time so, they have tried to impose sanctions absolutely. to roll it you back. You quoted the numbers. Not. You yeah. look at it, the rising curve of the numbers. You know, it tells a story by itself. Yes. Because the jump is taking place whenever they were snubbed. Absolutely. And uh, there was a uh, refusal on the part of the Americans to engage them. This could have been done actually by Bush. They had made the offer. Iran, if yes. you remember, had made the yes. offer at that time. Yes. We'll cap the nuclear program. You should you normalize know, There relations. are things we uh, overlook. For example, they cooperated with the American inter intervention in Afghanistan in 2001. And uh, they passed on very valuable intelligence to the American forces uh, against Al-Qaeda. You know, so you, you, you see the, 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 the late motive for the, 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 the impetus for the regime. Impetus was definitely in terms of a constructive engagement of the Western world. You talked about Iran being besieged. One of the reasons they intervened partially in Iraq, also in Syria, mm -hmm. is also the fact that the forces which are rising there, mm -hmm. the, Basically, the kind of Islam which was lying there, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. was inimical to the kind of Islam that is there in Iran mm -hmm. and would also be a long-term threat to it. Do you see, therefore, 
that actually these forces, supposedly the ones which also attacked the United States, 9-11, there was a common, even a common basis for all the powers in the region to come together to prevent it. But instead of that, Iran is thought to be isolated. These forces are thought to be turned against Syria and also latently against Iran. Would that be one of the also issues where, where the West really uh, played, shall we say, a more destructive card in West Asia? Well, uh, Prabir, no, there is a lot of sophistry here, you know, in the sense that, you know, that Al-Qaeda's creation, uh, you have to point the finger at the United States. There's no other way, you know, like, uh, I, I mean, I worked for a long time in my career on Afghanistan, and uh, I have had access to a lot of uh, privileged information. And uh, it's very clear that, you know, that there was American backing for Osama bin Laden, and uh, he was transferred from Africa to uh, Afghanistan. And they had, uh, at that time, the CIA's favorite group was nothing other than this Haqqani's uh, group. Uh, Itihad, you know that group, and they prevailed, they contacted him directly to uh, keep him there. Uh, so, you know, this is how it began. And then one thing led to another, you know, and then, you know, it, it was bound to happen. They spun out of American control, and, uh, you know, they got fired up, you know, and then they demanded the uh, exit of Americans from Saudi Arabia and, you know, their problem with the Saudi regime. All kinds of elements got into it, and then they hit at the Americans, you know. Now, in uh, the case of Islamic State, virtually it is the same thing. This all goes back to Brzezinski's brainwave to, you know, inject this poison of radical Islam uh, uh, in a, uh, through terrorist groups to uh, surf geopolitical agenda, starting Cauc from Afghanistan. Caucasus also the other target. In Chechnya, the same thing is done. Exactly. And uh, uh, I even fear that uh, at some point, uh, you know, they might even turn towards Xinjiang, you know. And in fact, you know, they are uh, uh, hundreds or thousands of them from Xinjiang are uh, working with as uh, Islamic State fighters and uh, we're working in uh, Syria. And that is China's involvement in the Syrian conflict, one major consideration for China. And Chechnya being the other contingent. Chechnya and the entire North Caucasus, you know, oh. Dagestan, Chechnya, all these, Ingushetia, all these places. So essentially, so US you know, try to use this yeah, against Iran yeah. as well as Russia, even against China. In that China. Is the yeah, Iran's very important because the point is these groups are also uh, subscribing to the Wahhabi ideology. And uh, they are anti-Shiite, and they are virulently anti-Shiite. You know that you know, like the Hazara Shias in Afghanistan, or you know, in their crosshairs. You know, this kind of thing is there. So um, you can't find a better proxy than this to hit at Iran. Iran's uh, uh, involvement in uh, Iraq is also very curious. It is not in terms of uh, these terrorist groups or anything. It is that the Americans, you know, the neocons there, you know, with their uh, thing that they should, you know, uh, make all countries democratic. So they introduced democracy there in Iraq. Now these guys didn't know that, you know, that means, you know, empowerment of Shias. <laughs> and also those Shia groups yeah. which had been sheltered in the Iran sheltered against Saddam Iran. for so a very long time. So you see, that's what happened. And then this, uh, uh, this Islamic State came. Now the, uh, the Iranians had a dilemma that if they hadn't uh, intervened in Syria, they would have had to fight this Islamic State on their territory. In, in. So this, uh, why today, uh, we have the a major operation going on in uh, southwestern Syria, Syria, bordering Jordan and uh, Israel. Uh, Israel, Jolan Heights. Actually. Yeah, uh, now Dara province of uh, Syria has been completely liberated, and uh, I read this morning that the operation is completed in about seventy percent of Kunetra. Kunetra is the one which is straddling Golan Heights. Yes. Now that is. It's acknowledged by everybody that they are Islamic State fighters. It's a, it was a problematic area. And you know? it was supported by, supported by Israel. Israel. Yes. Now you see the, the thing is, you know, we uh, here in India particularly, you know, we have this notion that Israel is a very important partner for India. 
uh, our at least our ruling elite and our establishment you know claims that you know Israel is a very important partner for India in fighting terrorism now, this is a country which is actually sponsoring Islamic State as a proxy Absolutely. in in Syria and you know lots and lots of weapons have been confiscated during these operations with Israeli markings and as you uh, know they provide hospital services yes, yes. that they take it from yes. Syria into Israel yes, yes. from through Jolan and the, they come back uh, again. This um, Iranian website this morning I was reading, Fars News Agency, uh, they had a report that uh, some of the prominent commanders, uh, who the Syrian uh, forces knew these commanders, they have escaped actually into Israel. Israel will send them away later. But through yeah. Jolan, they have escaped now yeah. into yes, Israel. Yes, yes. So this is, in fact, the numbers are about some thousands, I'm told. Yes, Again, yes. The numbers are pretty large. And then uh, the Russians have been saying this all along, that uh, this uh, uh, American special forces on eastern border of uh, Syria, Syrian-Iraqi border, the, one of their main tasks is to give shelter to the Islamic State fighters. To keep and them in the, keep them in, there. incubate them for yes, the future. Yes, yes. So coming back to the issue that you raised earlier, when President Trump says that Iran's foreign policy is not good, they have to change it. What they're leaving out is the fact of what the U.S. foreign policy in this space area has been, and if they don't really intervene on the side of what I would call larger secular polities, they're endangering their own country as well. No, you see, the thing is, what is taking place can be very, very uh, simply put this way, that uh, the, this project starting from 2011, regime change project in Syria, Israelis got into the act in a big way, and they had this notion that uh, it's a walkover. You know, in no time, Assad will flee from there. He dug in, he fought, and now he won that. I am not getting into the detail, Russian intervention and all took place, but the point is the balance sheet today, that battle has been lost. Now the thing is, in that theater, that is Syria, Iraq together, anywhere around 200,000 strong militia who were aligned with Assad's government forces and also with the uh, fighting in Iraq, they were trained by the uh, Iranians and battle-hardened. Seven years they've been fighting. I know this militia is there. Now, this is a hybrid war. No country is attacking Syria. It's a hybrid war. You're sending in proxies. Now, in this hybrid war, uh, Israel's military superiority Israel has been the dominant power because of the sheer military superiority outstripping all other countries in the region. That has become irrelevant. So you see something like what took place after the 2006 war in Lebanon, they went in and then the Hezbollah resisted and then they didn't know how to withdraw in fact. You know. And now since then the Israelis have never gone anywhere near Lebanon. They don't attack you know, because they know that now the same kind of situation is developing in Syria. Syria. And now look at that country. It is uh, in terms of social formation, one of the most advanced countries in the Arab world, uh, an elite with a cosmopolitan outlook, staunchly secular and a plural society. That is, you say that, you know, that uh, an Alawite uh, minority is disproportionately there, but it's not that the regime is just Alawite. There is a substantial social base even among the Sunnis and so on, Christians and so on. Now you see this kind of a country, you know, uh, with all the warts and all, uh, it was worth preserving in my opinion. And uh, it could have been a situation now, this uh, young man who was trained as a doctor in UK, and uh, he was a Westernist. His first visit after becoming president of Syria was actually to Paris. You know, he had a very special uh, feeling towards France and the Western world like this. So they, he, they could have nudged him 
towards you know opening up and all that and he was in fact uh, he, he had already he had embarked on quite a bit. that kind of a thing now they have destroyed this country so his father hafiz uh, didn't go for uh, any trouble with the israelis just accepted the occupation and was marking time but i think bashar will now demand vacation of the occupation yeah. So there is a resistance movement going to shape up there. This is actually the problem. And that is why they have to, uh, the force behind it is Iran. And that is why Trump has got into the act. This is basically a dishonest plea. Absolutely. All the arguments. This, I told you this is sophistry. This sophistry. is completely. Because you see, they have argued about missile, which mm -hmm. is not included in the nuclear agreement. Mm -hmm. Their missile range is far lower than Saudi Arabia's Absolutely. or even Absolutely. Uh, United you Arab said Emirates. It. Yes, you said it. And yeah. the basic problem they have mm -hmm. is this missile distance reaches Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, one of the problems they have, mm -hmm. but still a sh not a very long range missile. So this whole missile technology is bogus. It was not there in the agreement. The talk about foreign policy is bogus. Mm -hmm. So it really rests on extra considerations not extenuous considerations, none of these. This is to uh, bring back the balance of forces in that region in favor of Israel. Which is shifting otherwise against it Israel. It is completely shifting. And also the core issue of the Palestinian issue is uh, lying there. And when this balance shifts like this, there is going to be trouble all around. Then the Israelis will come under uh, compulsion to address the Palestinian issue and but you know the whole the whole ideology of Israel and the whole geopolitical agenda behind the creation of Israel everything is this you have to put a question mark there. Ambassador Vandra Kumar the other issue really historically looking a country which has a Jewish population of six and a half million forget for the time being the internal dissension another six and a half million Palestinian population, leaving that out. The, can it even hope to control an area today which has a population of 300 million and with countries like Iran, population of 80 million, just the sheer economic size of these countries are so much at variance. Does it not change the geostrategic? It is, it is, uh, it, it is absolutely the case. You know, the point is it is only the blank check from the Americans. But now there also, there is a problem. They are no longer going to be able to come and fight wars. And uh, there is a certain kind of retrenchment taking place there. And with that, you know, it's, uh, Israel has to really address a very bleak future, in my opinion. This is all the last uh, act of the bravado, the swagger, you know. This is, you are absolutely right, this is not sustainable. You know, the other geostrategic balance which has shifted post-90, fall of Soviet Union, Soviet Union or the following state, Russia, the uh, state that lay, it takes over, Russia has withdrawn literally from West Asia or all of these places. Now with Russia facing the kind of pressure it has in Crimea and Ukraine, it's sort of coming back into international, at least into international play, shall we say. And uh, Syria has been the first test case where they have, post Libya, where they did not do much. That Syria, they have learned a lesson. And after Libya, they didn't want it to fall. You know, it is, um, it is not uh, because of the, uh, not only because of this uh, threat of uh, radical Islam and terrorist groups and all that, uh, along the Russian underbelly. It's not only because of that, you know, you must also probably see this, that uh, Russians do not want to uh, be caught on the wrong foot, like in the Cold War era. That is ideologically, communism versus Islam. You know, this sort of a propaganda by the West, it really got entrenched there. And uh, therefore, they were the antithesis so now what they, what they are doing is therefore, without being prescriptive, they are engaging even Islamic countries there, number one. Number two, uh, this is a system, the Russian system today, they are avid globalizers. 
you know, they are globalizing in a big way. So they are picking up, for instance, railway projects in Saudi Arabia, and they are negotiating S-400 missiles uh, sales to, to Qatar, India. Qatar, 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 yes, and uh, with the UAE. And now uh, they have a, a deal with op uh, with the captain of OPEC with Saudi Arabia on oil oil production and so on. You see, the uh, the Russian involvement is uh, is uh, something that they have brilliantly worked out with a view to seeing that uh, the mistakes of the Cold War era are not repeated. And uh, today you take Syria for example, it's a, te it's a test case. They are the only power, big power, which is on talking terms with all the protagonists. That's true. They have been talking to Israel very closely. Israel, Saudi they Arabia. They have given concessions Saudi to Arabia, it. Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, Qatar, uh, even the countries which are supporting the Islamic State, they have uh, brilliantly managed the relationship. So, you know, the, uh, the Americans have a problem there also. Now, you know, the, uh, the thing is, is, and then there is the other player who has appeared on the horizon. Uh, but with immense potential that is China. So, you know, the, uh, when you look at it uh, on the chessboard, uh, you find a, a hopeless situation from the American point of view. There is a, you know, Shift. basically once, you know, this Kishore Mohamani said in a, in a piece about uh, three, four years ago, that the, basically the problem is the American intellectuals are still unable to reconcile with this thought uh, you know, it's surprising because, you know, in the Financial Times, uh, with the thought that, uh, you know, that sort of uh, uh, capacity to influence and dictate is no longer there for the Americans. Financial Times, Edward Lucas had a, a lunch with FT. <coughs> it was Kissinger on uh, Thursday. And Kissinger mentioned this. Kissinger mentioned that, you know, that uh, he would induce, you know, what Trump is doing in certain ways because the point is, uh, it is not possible now for the United States to do it all this previous way. This is the ref uh, reference to uh, Helsinki summit. But that's the point, you know, that uh, there you find today also that, you know, that there is really, there is great reluctance to uh, accept that the world is changed, that the locus of power is shifted, and uh, they don't have the kind of Western alliance system any longer operating like this. It was actually evident as far back as 2003 when Germany and France said that they are not going to come into Iraq, you know. And uh, they had to settle with just UK, you know, the coalition of the willing. So uh, these are all uh, playing out. You know, that's, that's the markers why, for the yes, future. Yes, that's why I said in the beginning that you know that uh, there are many layers. The core is this uh, that uh, they have to dismantle. Uh, they have to firstly they have to stop, roll back, and destroy Iran. That is at the core. If they want the geostrategic dominance of Israel to continue, continue. In the area. Last question: Do you think it lead to a shooting war with Iran? Do you think that's possible? or this is a prelude to coming to a negotiating table, and this is an opening gambit by Trump. Let's restart the negotiations, but on a different footing. You know, when you look at that part of it, uh, I have extensively dealt with Iran. You know, I've been there so many times, and I know their uh, elite, you know, their mindset and what drives them. Uh, they're very pragmatic. Mind you, something like uh, half of Rohani's cabinet, they are people who are trained in American universities. Yes. And uh, Zarif, you know, he is on Twitter with Nancy Pelosi and others, you know. And uh, so, you know, they are all over the place, you know. As I uh, briefly mentioned earlier, their driving force there is this, that they want to have uh, their economy revamped and put it on a stabler footing because the regime faces a challenge there and they don't want to be caught in a situation of rising expectations that they are unable to fulfill 
and thereby the legitimacy of the regime getting undermined. This is the, this is the main thing. Central issue for them. They are not projecting power into other countries and they have not created these situations. You take Yemen for example. Yemen's conflict didn't even like uh, Trump and all say that Iran is behind it. It didn't start yesterday or day before yesterday. This is going on for a long time. You know, this is the second or third time that the Saudis have militarily intervened in uh, Yemen. If you remember Saudis and the Houthis are the same side. Absolutely. And so this 50s is and 60s. yeah, it, this shifting sands, you know. So uh, the point is this that uh, the when you come to Iran, therefore, uh, to answer your question, yes, they will deal. But the point is, they should there should be an enlightened leadership in America, not this uh, one-dimensional hollow men, like at the leadership level, like that country has got today. But the saving grace is here is that. Uh, this man is also a businessman. President Trump, Trump is Trump finally is a, yeah. real estate tycoon and businessman. A businessman. And uh, I doubt if uh, you know he will overrule the Pentagon's advice and order the troops as the commander-in-chief to go into Iran. And it's a big country. It's, you know, it's two-thirds the size of India. It's landmass. And it's very difficult terrain. And going there and occupying that country is unthinkable. And then not only that, before they enter, uh, Iran can be trusted, in fact, you know, to hit back in a way that there are going to be huge casualties. There's going to be disruption in the world economy. These, all these Gulf countries, they've already said that if they are intimidated, they will stop the flow of oil into the world market. Can you imagine a situation that, you know, there's oil shortage like that. Western economies and everything will be, you know. Entire global economy. Absolute global economy will be in turmoil. So that, the fact that uh, Trump is, uh, there's maybe a possibility in a second term, unless this is settled, that he may do something like that. And I don't think also that the Pentagon will uh, really go along with an agenda to wage a war on Iran. So I think a constructive engagement can take place. Now, if you look back six months back, this was not the rhetoric towards North Korea yes. that you hear today. So uh, it is quite possible. But the main problem is uh, then uh, Israel will have to understand. I'd, that is the main problem because understand means what? that it has to address the Palestinian issue. You see, it has to, uh, you know, behave like a normal state. Like uh, every month it is going and attacking some, uh, whether it's Gaza or uh, day before yesterday, they went and shot, they sent missiles into uh, Gaza, again. Uh, Gaza again, then to Syria. So, you know, this kind of uh, thing cannot happen, cannot work. That is the main problem. Is it possible to delink Israel and Iran issue is the challenge. And as of now, they seem to be linked, at least in the US view of the West Asian scenario. That's a key problem. That is, that is, that is, that is where the, uh, the whole thing has become such a knot, you know. And of course, you have the other issues that in spite of the best intentions of people not to go to war, mm -hmm. war can still take place after all that First World War I took think still place uh, we should um, uh, we should not uh, look at it like that because we should um, uh, there is always a possibility a margin of error is always there but in this particular case I refuse to contemplate a war because simply because it will be such a catastrophe consequences of the world will be horrendous mm -hmm. thank you ambassador Badrakbar to be mm -hmm. for being with us today and we hope to see you more, though your visits to Delhi are now infrequent. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.